Michelle Martinez. I'll just read off of this because it's really quite impressive. Michelle Martinez is currently completing her PhD in political science at USC. Her dissertation investigates the need for photography and social movements and the subsequent criminalization of photography. An avid photographer, Michelle earned two bachelors from USC in political science and fine arts. Her photography has taken her across the globe from China to document the aftermath of the SARS outbreak to Thailand after the tsunami. As a self-identified activist, she helps organize initiatives to address local and national labor issues, increase awareness of the injustices in the prison system, and most recently was actively involved in the Occupy movement in Los Angeles. Michelle joins us today to talk about her experiences as a photographer and a scholar, and discuss the importance of imagery and photography in understanding civil rights and the individual's place in an evolving, increasingly interconnected society. Oh, that's weird. You're looking at me and looking at it. It's fine. Uh, so can you guys give me a round of applause for Michelle? Uh, welcome. I would... Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Yay. Yay. Uh, so we talked about... Um, some of the stuff that I'd, I'd love, to, that my students and I would love to hear you talk about. Very briefly, here are the four major questions that I'd love for you to answer. What do you do? How did you get into it? Uh, and why you think photography is important? And then we'll close with any recommendations you have for um, young photographers, activists, and scholars. So where would you like to start? Okay, well, we can go in order. Um, hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, like Cherise said, I'm working on a PhD in... Oh, there you are. Hey. Uh, I'm working on a PhD in politics, and I do politics and visual culture, politics of photography. Um, my undergrad degrees are in photo and political science or politics. Um, what do I do? So I consider myself sort of, I don't know, I guess I have a bunch of different parts of my personality, but I consider myself an activist first, and then a photographer, and then a scholar. Um, my entire life has been pretty centered around activism. I've been involved in labor movements because of family. I've been in unions myself. Uh, you know, I do racial justice work as, as a Mexican-American with Brown Beret parents. It was sort of not an option. Uh, and so I've been doing activism for, you know, as long as I can remember, ever since I was pretty little. Uh, my dad was in the army, and he was a photographer, and he's the one who really introduced me to photography. There are still boxes of photographs that I'm not allowed to look at. Um, I'm, I, I don't know what's in there, but it's, it's stuff from when he went uh, over during Vietnam and Korea. He, was, uh, he joined, but um, so that he could have sort of less time. If you got drafted, you got more time. So he was a photographer for the U.S. Army, did a lot of reconnaissance and stuff like that in the demilitarized zone of Korea and showed me sort of the, the photographic ropes. I still use film. I still use big, bulky cameras, um, medium format, large format, uh, bags of film in the fridge, that sort of thing. So um, I still do a lot of traditional photography. Uh, and I use it to document social movements. I do sort of undercover investigations, <laughs> the, you know, trespass and stuff like that. Uh, I work with cop watch groups who document police brutality and misconduct of all kinds, uh, lots of racial profiling, things like that. So I've done, I've done everything from investigations on farms and, and things like that having to do with animals to, you know, whether a farm's actually organic or are they using chemicals, these sorts of things. Um, like Sheree said, I worked with Occupy. I was camping out for a while. Uh, Occupy here in Los Angeles. Uh, I had some friends who were based with uh, the Wall Street group at Zuccotti Park and elsewhere as well. I uh, worked with the National Lawyers Guild and I did a lot of work for them, their photography, some of their design stuff. Uh, the National Lawyers Guild is a leftist bar association, the first one that was integrated. It was formed in the 30s. And uh, we do a lot of international human rights work. Uh, I've done a lot of international human rights work. I went to, uh, again, like was said, uh, Nanking after SARS. I went to various parts of Thailand 
I did a little undercover work there as well on sweatshop conditions. Uh, I was initially there to do work on the tsunami and reconstruction and to follow the money. Where was the money going? Was it being used properly? Was it uh, going to religious organizations that were saying, if you want money, then why don't you put a cross on the front of your boat? <laughs> okay, you won't do that. Oh, you're Muslim or oh, you're Buddhist, then I guess you can't have this money. Uh, so there was there was a bit of that. Uh, and I think that photography is something that can help me to tell stories. It can help people understand things in a way that they don't intuitively understand from statistics uh, or from reading, you know, a few inches in the news story. Or like you guys were talking about earlier with the 24-hour news, right? The, oh, we're out of time is kind of the equivalent of there are only so many pages or we only have so many inches in the newspaper to tell this story. And um, I think especially with the advent of the internet and social media, there are more opportunities for us to use a lot of pages, a lot of bandwidth, a lot of gigs to tell stories that have context and that, that range in, uh, like they were saying, you can see, or I forget who it was that was saying that he watches different news groups so that he can get a variety of perspectives. Well, this can show you a variety of things about a conflict. You know, it's not always going to be one perspective that wins, and poverty has many different aspects to it, and poverty is structural. So it's not just showing people in tatters. It's about showing where the money is going. It's about showing political corruption, these sorts of things, and I think that photography helps me to do that. I think the most political act is to direct someone's eyes. And so when I use images to show people things that they're not usually seeing, then then I've done my job. Um, because the powers that be, corporations, government, police, things like that, they tend to direct our eyes towards things that are a little bit more, tri pardon me, trivial. Or maybe not trivial, but things that reinforce their interests. So my job is to force people to look elsewhere or to think about what it is that they're not being allowed to see. You know, why can't I see flag drive coffins? Why can't I see what's going on with war and things like that? Why do I only get to see the images from the embedded photographers that are on the U.S. dime? That sort of thing. So that's, in a nutshell, I guess, what I do. Uh, thank you. I'll just turn this around so that I'm not a disembodied voice. Um, so. Two questions. Uh, you kind of already touched on why photography is important, but I would really also like for you to maybe expand on that and also talk a little bit about what photography means in a new media and environment. So not just um, the stories that we share and the amount of pages we can fill, but also um, who is taking photographs, where these photographs are coming from, and what is what does it mean to criminalize photography? Okay. So I, I think that it's really interesting that when Kodak started his company and, you know, where George Eastman was starting Kodak, uh, you know, the idea was that, oh, everyone can have this. Everyone can take pictures and it's going to be democratizing, kind of like the Internet, right? The Internet is going to bring us all on the same page. It's democratizing. Everyone can use it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think that the fusion of those two things is a really interesting opportunity because you have you know, people who have cell phones and then Im immediately they're someone who can watch the cops, right? They can, they can show us that the police actually did tase this kid and, and look at what happened to his face. They beat him. They tried to say that he fell. I'm sorry, but when you look at his face, he did not fall, okay? So I, I don't want to say, oh, the, the, the pictures prove it or, you know, photographs never lie because clearly they do and we have Photoshop to uh, prove that, but uh, photography and the technology, social media makes it so much more possible for all of us to kind of watch the watchers. And when the government says, we don't want you to take photos of that, or when a policeman says, you're obstructing justice, this is hostile reconnaissance, you're a terrorist, I mean, that's, that's just them coming up with reasons to bring you downtown 
for 20 minutes before you're released, right? So there's this activist proverb that says, you can beat the rap, but you can't beat the ride. So they immediately have interrupted your ability to be a truth teller and to share with other people that the police are racially profiling, they're uh, illegally detaining people. You know, a, a lot of the stop and frisk activity that was focused on in New York with the Floyd case that just came down and it's sort of a mess right now, but um, a lot of the stop and frisk activity was caught on video and just put on various cop watch pages spread around. And I, I think that, that this is a, a genie that they can't put back in the bottle, that the government has tried to prevent us from seeing things that it does that are against the law, uh, everything from torture to, like I was saying, racial profiling and things like that. Uh, and it's it's a little too late. <laughs> we're all we're all armed, or as as some people say, cameras are the new guns. You know, we it's it's one way that people can take power back. And with police and government trying to to criminalize just the very act of watching them, public officials that we pay money for them to have a job, they're saying that we're not allowed to monitor their activity. And that's, one, not true. I mean, legally, we do have that right. It's in the First Amendment and in the Fourth Amendment, and we can talk about other amendments, but um, primarily in the First Amendment, legally, it is our right. Anything in public, it's our right. So I, I, I find the, the criminalization aspect really troubling, especially as a person of color who does a lot of that kind of work, but I'm also a woman who passes, and I'm sort of non-threatening. So when I'm doing the photography, it's not—it's not—it doesn't seem as threatening to a policeman as it does when some of my friends, like at uh, LA Community Action Network or people I work with on Skid Row, uh, sort of the homelessness district in downtown Los Angeles, when they're doing photography because the police have come down really hard on that area. It's the most policed area per capita in LA. Uh, when they're doing photography, you know, it's woo woo, the lights go and they're gone. And, um, you know, they're up against a wall, their camera's on the ground. So it's, it's interesting being a woman who looks white and <laughs> coming up against police when I'm also working with people of color who have a very opposite phenotype to me. Um, so I, I guess I also try to exploit that privilege as well. Thank you. Uh, so to go a little bit deeper as well, can you talk, um, you talked about your Occupy Wall Street time, and I've got some pictures. You actually can't see them. I've got them in a little frame showing up on the side. Um, but can you also talk a little bit about the kind of stuff you do in labor unions or with labor uh, as that's not really a topic that we often hear about anymore. It's as I said before, the not so distant history, but it's still a very relevant issue. So if you could talk a little bit about the work you do and how you use photography to bring that issue to the forefront, and more importantly, what would you like to see uh, in moving forward regarding that issue? Okay. Um, so I've done a few different things. I, I work as an activist with labor groups. Uh, like I said, I've been in a couple of unions myself. I'm still a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW. Uh, and when I went to Thailand, even though I was there to do tsunami reconstruction stuff, I was sort of carted around to a bunch of different projects that were being funded by major corporations, including Nike. And so I was able to sort of surreptitiously take photos at factories where they would have preferred I didn't. There were signs that said no photography. There uh, were people sort of reinforcing that. At one point I almost got caught, but I was able to hide my flashcard in my belt loop. Uh, total luck, really. Um, but what I was able to show was that a lot of these factories had pretty young people there, you know, to the point where they had kids sitting at the end of a table and, you know, their mom would be working there, and then she'd be done, and she'd throw the piece of garment on the floor or whatever. It might have just been a piece, not necessarily a completed garment. And the kid would clip the strings. So, you know, these were poorly ventilated. Not everyone had safety protection. Sometimes people were barefoot. 
know, they, they were convincing people to give up land that had belonged to villages for, you know, eons. And they were saying, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll give you motorbikes. You'll have all this money to go do what you want. But they couldn't have the land anymore. They couldn't farm it. It had been taken over. There was a bunch of, you know, toxic chemicals now from because that's what factories make. In addition to the clothes that we wear, they make a lot of damage in terms of the environment. Um, so that's that's part of a larger story that I was able to tell, you know, at, at, at what cost? These people didn't have a choice anymore to go back to a life they had before, and not everyone was involved in the decision making. Uh, you know, sort of women and children were marginalized, things like that. Uh, so I think that there are broader stories that can be told as regards the labor movement, uh, international solidarity efforts. There are factories here in downtown that are connected to factories abroad in Korea, Thailand, Bangladesh had that big fire. Uh, or uh, several incidents actually, it's not just the, the major Trezrine fire that we heard about here. Uh, so there are a lot of very multifaceted stories that can be told about labor. It's, you know, it's about race, it's about, fundamentally it's about capitalism and how we drive prices down. Uh, you know, there's that Walmart documentary, the, the high cost of low price or something like that. Um, and there, there's a documentary about Disney factories in Haiti, and they, they tell, I think, broader stories about who is not only implicated, which we all are, uh, in, you know, sort of the, I don't, domination sounds like a very harsh word, but really there is sort of Western domination of a bunch of other countries through labor, through capitalism. And I think that there are ways that photography, videography, whether it's undercover or it's you know, on the on the up and up, um, that we can tell these stories so that people have a better sense of exactly what it is that I might be contributing to these the the <laughs> the, the misery and sort of difficulties uh, and the the problems that are part of global cap capitalism, and then. You know, I, I generally try to make suggestions about alternatives or what we can do and things like that. So I, 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 I find it very disappointing when I'm, I'm left feeling depressed or overcome, and I think that that's something that a lot of us feel when we're looking at photographs of devastation. You know, we're looking at, um, like, Tacloban uh, in the Philippines, and we're just like, well, what could we possibly do that would make a difference? Um, and I, I don't think it's charity. I don't think it's donating money. Uh, you know that that doesn't fundamentally undermine capitalism whatsoever. It sort of reinforces it. We, we can buy our way to a better world. No, I, I don't think that that's true. I fundamentally disagree with that. Um, but I think that photography that gives us an alternative or shows us other ways to think about problems or encourages us to do something about problems instead of just leaves us sort of disembodied and defeated is uh, it's something that I definitely strive for in my own work. I know that you asked about Occupy Wall Street. Um, I, I found that in the beginning a lot of the photography was sort of varied. It was coming from news sources who were sort of watching uh, Occupy, wondering, you know, what's next? What's their story? What, what do they want? What do they want? What do they want? Who's their leader? Um, and then there was photography coming from within the camps that was about solidarity and how we were trying to build alternative communities where they were built on inclusivity and everyone gets to be heard and things like that, you know. Uh, but eventually, what what I how I began began to think about the photography of Occupy was these sort of visual rhetorics where. It's they're they're the protester photos, they're the dirty hippie photos, they're the this is so trivial photos, and then there are the um, we're gonna kick the crap out of them photos, <laughs> and there was really really nothing else. Uh, you know, after after a while, all the photos kind of went into these pads, uh, and they, there wasn't anything new or innovative. We already could predict what the next photo was going to be of. And, and they didn't really seem to draw our attention. And I, I think that that's on 
it's on Occupy as well as on the media, but it's so much easier to tell a predictable story, right? Um, it's just, it, it, it easily makes sense. It fits into these boxes that we can comprehend quickly, and I think that that's something that needs to change socially, and obviously it's really hard to, to change the way that people think or want to think and the way that we practice how we read the news, but I think that, that reading images and reading the world and reading politics should be harder than it is. The sound bites that we're given and the, the simple solutions like donate, um, donate to the Red Cross that has huge overhead and, and sometimes money is still sitting in accounts and isn't going anywhere. Um, there, there isn't an easy answer and I think that right now a lot of news suggests that there is. A lot of photography suggests that there is. And I think that that's a responsibility for all of us who are still working in, in civil rights, in human rights, and in media to, to get people's attention in new and innovative ways. Um, you guys had uh, another guest speaker who was talking about creating content versus ads. Uh, and I, I thought that he was really, really interesting, but I, I think that that's something that really the human rights and civil rights community, the animal rights community, vegans over there, um, that we need to work on making people pay attention to things and think about things instead of just going, oh, okay, yeah, that was a nice story. I have no wonderful closing comment for that because I feel like that statement was extremely powerful unto itself. But um, in the interest of time, I do want to offer any students that have questions. Uh, but before I ask that, how many of you are photography or graphic design majors? About one? Really? Just one? Two? Couple? Um, and how many of you posted a photograph on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever in the past week? Right? So technically, I don't know if you can see all the hands. Keep them up for me. Let's get a good scan here. Uh, if you can see how many technical photographers we have in the audience, even though we only have one or two technical photography majors. So uh, I'll open up the floor for anybody who has any questions. Are there any questions for Michelle regarding her research, some of the things that she's seen, anything that you find particularly fascinating when it comes to photography? Uh, we've got a question from Matt here on the side. He looks kind of hesitant, but uh, let me know if you can. Can you say your name out loud, see if she can uh, hear you? Nice can you hear that? Wah, 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 wah. All right, well, then you're going to have to come on up, Matt. Sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All the way. All the way. <laughs> Uh, when you talked about the question and you used Occupy Wall Street as your example and like how the photos get redundant after a while, um, and then you kind of asked this question like how do we change this? And I was just wondering about more about Occupy Wall Street and how they're questioning like how we find government. And like one way I thought we could like approach this issue is like we have like all oh, the whole class who's taking photographs, and I'm sure we know someone. I know many people personally that are affected by the economic downturn of what's going on in this country and I was thinking like we all are aware like we take photos but we're not like aware of like the power they possess and I'm thinking like if we find a way to like motivate like just us as like generation I don't know what we are so and just so that we understand like the power that we can create because there's moments where I'm getting nervous when I'm talking about it. That's okay if I can summarize what I think that Matt is trying to say <laughs> is um, how do we turn all of these casual photographers into uh, agents for justice? And the phrase sounds cheesy, but I think it's really valuable, yes? Um, apparently, I got a thumbs up on that interpretation. So what are your thoughts in moving forward? How do we turn all this casual photography into a meaningful movement? Okay, so I, I don't want to say stop taking pictures of your lunch, because that's not going to happen. Uh, 
But I think, and you know, sometimes lunch looks really good. Um, but I think that at bottom we need to just be paying attention more. And I know that it's it's really easy to get sucked into things like who was it the other back kid or whatever. You know, a bunch of the they used to call it bread and circus, right? So if the government distracts you and you're well fed, then everything's good and the government gets to keep doing what it wants. Um, but like Matt was saying, we have so many of us who are impacted by the economic downturn. You know, like I have a couple jobs, my dad has a couple jobs, um, and there, there's no way that that we're not being impacted somehow. You know, I mean, maybe maybe in college it doesn't feel um, as hard for most people, uh, but. I think that, that paying attention is the number one thing that we can each do to make a difference. And if we, like I said, we have these <laughs> superpower cell phones that are cameras now, and we can, we can use them to show you know, what, what it is that's hard. There was an, an image that was circulated by a Walmart employee the other day, and now it's getting a bunch of play even on sort of national news. It was on the Today Show this morning. But they're talking about how Walmart is having food drives, canned food drives, so that their own employees can have, you know, a happy holiday. Uh, you know, so what does that say about whether this corporation that claims that it does good by its employees, what does it say about the fact that they don't pay a living wage? People do have health care problems that uh, they don't have insurance for there. You know, they're not getting enough hours a week. They're getting, you know, just enough so that they don't have to get health coverage and other sorts of benefits. Um, so that was someone who is probably taking pictures of lunch. And then they were like, hey, look at, look at what's going on at my work. You know, we can't even have a happy holiday without Walmart trying to get other people at our own work, my own fellow employees, to donate canned goods. So I think that, that Paying attention, just noticing the signs, seeing seeing what it is that people are struggling with, and and thinking about it instead of sort of being like, oh, that's a bummer, you know, or isn't that stupid, or you know, that that person sort of grosses me out. They use their coffee grounds twice, um, <laughs> you know, like I have. Um, I think I think it comes down to paying attention, and we we all have the capability. To, to be agents for change, and I, I, I think it's about paying attention. Thank you. Uh, my last comment in the interest of time, which I think I've already said twice because I'm a 24-hour news network, um, <laughs> my last question or your last thoughts, because we have so many uh, new media producers in this room, and many of them may not be photography majors, what recommendations as a photographer would you give to media uh, scholars, producers who are not photographers? Okay. So I think, I think I have one basic suggestion. And maybe it sounds, um, I don't know, too basic. But make your own opportunities. Because there aren't always going to be people who want to pay you to do the work that you think is important. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, maybe that means volunteering or, or taking on an extra job so that you can pay for it and, and fund your own projects. Maybe it means figuring out Kickstarter or Indiegogo or whatever. Um, but I, I only went on a bunch of the international trips that I went on because I said, you need a photographer on that project. You know, how are you just going to send a bunch of people to do a policy report? You need to see what it looks like over there. What does it look like on the ground? So if you're if you're in social media, if you're in engineering and you're designing cell phone programs or apps or whatever, you know, you need to be thinking about other people who need you and and argue for yourself. Make make it a point to make it seem like you are indispensable. How could they not have thought that, oh, we need this guy on our team? We need someone who does XYZ. You know, intuitively they're they're not thinking that. They're they're sort of tunnel vision in their own discipline or in their own work. But you have a lot to offer to businesses that maybe aren't necessarily in, you know, your your line of work. And I think that I think that that's all of us. Um, you know, I have something to offer people who do policy. 
I have something off people who do politics, people who do video. I don't really do video. I do still. I do really bulky cameras and you know big things of film. Um, you know, but there are there's a place for it, and and it's about really seeking out those those opportunities and thinking you know sort of laterally about where you could be of use and making yourself indispensable. All right. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Can I get a round of applause for Michelle, please? Give you one last view of the class. Yes. And Looking good, at Syracuse. And uh, I'll give you a call next week. I'll be in LA. Love it. That sounds great. All right. You have a good day. Have a good day. Fight the power.